Shadows are on the other side of light and no 3D scene is complete without them. In this video I'm going to introduce you to one of the most basic techniques for it. Shadow mapping. In the following scene there's a spotlight that rotates above and around the object while its target vector is fixed on the object. We can't see the actual light source, but you can kind of imagine where it's supposed to be based on how the light falls on the object. This is how things should look like based on all the previous lighting tutorials that we went through. Lighting is currently calculated based on the interaction between the light vector and the surface normal, regardless of whether or not some object is in the way. It's very easy to imagine where the shadow is supposed to be, so I'm gonna count to three and we will magically teleport to the location of the light source. One, two, three. Alright, so now the camera is attached to the light source and the camera target vector is synchronized with the target vector of the spotlight. I'm sure you'll agree that in these circumstances we're not supposed to be able to see any shadow whatsoever. The object perfectly hides the shadow that it casts on the terrain behind it. As always, since the depth test is enabled, we can only see the pixels that are closest to the camera. Well, in this case it's the same as saying that we can only see the pixels that are closest to the spotlight. So basically we can characterize the pixels that are in the shadows as follows. Any pixel that, when the scene is rendered from the point of view of the light source, fails the depth test, must be in the shadows regardless of where the actual camera is located. This is because that failing the depth test in this case means that there is another pixel which is projected to the same location on the screen, but is closer to the light source. Can we somehow use this fact in order to render shadows? Well, this is actually a great idea, and this is the basis for the shadow mapping technique which was invented already in 1978 by the late Lance J. Williams. In practice, this means that for every execution of the fragment shader, we need to do a shadow test. We need to check if there's another pixel on the vector that goes from the light source to the current fragment, which is closer to the light source. If there is one, then that pixel is blocking the light to our current pixel and we can decide whether we want to disable all lighting here or just decrease the light in some level. In order to do that, we will render the scene twice. The first time from the point of view of the light source to a buffer which is also known as a shadow map. This buffer contains only the depth values of the closest pixels, so there will be nothing on the screen at this stage. This render is called a shadow pass. The second time will be from the regular camera location and is called the lighting pass. The trick is to provide two WVP matrices to the vertex shader instead of one. One matrix is the regular matrix which is created by the world matrix of the object, the view matrix of the camera and the projection matrix. The second WVP matrix will be created from the same world matrix of the object a view matrix based on the spotlight location and direction, and a projection matrix for the light source. At this point I'd like to say that there are slight variations of this technique depending on the type of the light source, directional point or spotlight. I decided to start with the spotlight because it behaves the same as the regular camera. Both have a location and direction, so for the creation of the shadow map we can use the standard perspective projection matrix that we're already familiar with. In the next one or maybe two tutorials, I will cover the other two light sources. Okay, back to the second WVP matrix based on the light source. This is actually the same matrix that we used for the shadow pass. If this is the first time that you hear of this approach, it might be a bit confusing. What does it mean to have two WVP matrices in the same vertex shader? In the following diagrams, we can see the same triangle being rendered from two locations, the camera and the light source. The projected triangle has coordinates v1, v2, and v3 in the first case, and w1, w2, and w3 in the second case. When we provide the two WVP matrices to the same vertex shader, we use the one from the camera to update GL position, so the triangle will be rendered in the regular location. We use the second WVP matrix to transform the same position vector, and we pass the result to the fragment shader in a standard output attribute. This attribute is identical to the GL position of the shadow pass that uses the light WVP. This attribute will be interpolated per fragment. It will not be the same interpolated values as in the shadow pass simply because the triangle looks different from the two viewpoints, but the edges of interpolation are still the same. 
Remember that the rasterizer divides the gel position by the W component. This is called perspective division and we talked about it in the perspective projection tutorial. The attribute from the second WVP matrix is just a standard attribute, so this division will not happen automatically, but we can do it manually in the fragment shader in order to calculate the NDC coordinates that should roughly match what happened to this fragment in the shadow pass. I say roughly because there could be minor differences due to numerical accuracy issues. With one more simple transformation, we can transform the NDC coordinate to a texture coordinate that we can use to sample the depth value of the corresponding fragment in the shadow pass. This depth value, of course, belongs to the pixel which is closest to the light source. The question is whether the current fragment, when viewed during the lighting pass, has a depth value which is equal or greater than the one in the shadow map. If the depth value is the same or nothing has been rendered to the shadow map here, then this is the closest pixel, so it returns light as usual. If it is larger, it means that it is behind the closest pixel, and therefore it is in shadow. Okay, I hope I didn't confuse you too much. Let's review the implementation and clear out the remaining small issues. The first thing that we will need is a depth-only buffer, and for this we will create a frame buffer object, or FBO. You should be familiar with FBOs from the picking tutorial. I created a class called Shadow Map FBO for it. This class has an attribute for the FBO and also for the actual depth buffer. Shadow Map FBO is initialized with the width and height of the shadow map. The higher the resolution, the more accurate the shadow will be. Here's an example with a shadow map of 2K by 2K, and this is what we get with 200 by 200. Looks crappy, right? The reason is that with such low resolution, many pixels in the scene end up using the same depth value, even though in reality, they are a different depth. The size of the depth buffer may affect performance, so you will have to tune it for every scene and platform. Okay, so we begin by generating a handle for the FBO using GLGen frame buffers, and the standard 2D texture using GLGen textures, GLBind texture, and GLTextImage 2D. We also set a few texture parameters so the texture will be complete. Next, we bind the frame buffer object and attach the new texture as a depth attachment. Since this is a depth only frame buffer, we disable any access to the color buffer using GL draw buffer with GL none, and the same with GL read buffer. Also, make sure to check the frame buffer status for any errors and bind back the default frame buffer. Let's take a look at the main render function. It is now split to a shadow pass and the lighting pass. We start the shadow pass by binding the shadow map for writing. This simply means binding the new FBO as the draw target and setting the viewport parameters to cover the entire shadow map. This is critical when your shadow map and window have different sizes. Failing to set the viewport correctly for either passes will result in an incorrect transformation from NDC to the window. Next, we clear the frame buffer, but only the depth buffer. We enable the shadow map technique, which simply means calling GLUse program with the corresponding shader program, which we will see in a minute. We now need to generate a WVP matrix for the light source. The world matrix comes from the object itself as usual. Next, we initialize the view matrix from the light point of view. We use the spotlight position and direction vector in the world and the simple unit vector on the y-axis as the up vector. The function init camera transform was already covered in a previous tutorial, so I'll just remind you that it combines two matrices, a translation matrix using the negative value of the position vector, and a rotation matrix using the UVN matrix. The projection matrix for the light source was initialized in the constructor of the main class. This matrix can be different from the one that we're using for the regular render. It basically defines the extent of the view volume, so you may need to play with it to get the best results. Just remember to use the width and height of the shadow map and not the window. We calculate the WVP matrix, set it into the program, and render our object. In general, we need to repeat this process for every object in our scene. As you can see, I didn't render the terrain into the shadow map. Since it is flat and our current algorithm is still not too great, I wanted to avoid any aliasing issues. It depends on how your scene looks like. 
If the terrain is rough so that it may cause self-shadowing, you'll probably want to render it into the shadow map as well. The vertex shader of the shadow pass is very simple. We just need to multiply the vertex position by the WVP matrix. This will transform the Z-coordinate and place it in the shadow map at the location of the transformed X and Y. The fragment shader is empty. We're only rendering into the depth buffer, so no color. But the fragment shader must exist, so there it is. Once the shadow pass is complete, it's very important from a development standpoint to run the program and make sure that the depth buffer is created correctly. You can do this in a number of ways, but I find it the easiest to use API Trace where you can see the actual buffer. I have a quick overview of API Trace in my debugging tutorial. You can find the link in the video description below. So this is our shadow map and it looks okay. Pixels that haven't been rendered have the default depth of 1, so they are white. As the pixel becomes closer to the light source, it becomes darker as the depth decreases. Okay, cool. Now let's move on to the lighting pass. We start by binding back the default frame buffer and we also set the viewport according to the dimensions of the window. Again, very critical if your window and shadow map have a different size. We do the usual clearing, this time of both the color and the depth buffer. And we enable the lighting shader program. This is the same lighting technique that we've been developing over the course of the last few tutorials with the addition of shadow mapping support. Since we're going to sample from the shadow map, we need to bind it to the shader program. I organize my textures in a single file across my projects to avoid collision. For every texture type, we have both a texture unit and a texture unit index, and we need to be careful to use the correct one for the job. When we call GL Active Texture, we need to use the texture unit, and when we set the texture unit into the shader, we need to use the unit index. So we use 0 for the diffuse texture of the object and 1 for the shadow map. Binding the shadow map for reading simply means activating its texture unit and binding the shadow map handle to the GL Texture 2D target. We are now ready to start rendering the objects in the scene. The WVP matrix is created as usual, the world matrix is coming from the object and the view and projection matrices from the camera. The second WVP matrix is exactly the same as the one from the shadow pass. Same world matrix, but the view and projection matrices are coming from the light itself. The next few calls are, I guess, unique to my code. This is where we transform the position of the camera and the light source to the local space of the object, where I do the lighting calculations. In my older tutorials on my website and also on learnopengl.com by Joy DeVries, the light is calculated in world space. You can check my lighting videos for more details. However, this actually has no effect on the shadow, so you can handle lighting in whatever way you prefer. The object can now be rendered, and we continue to the next one, which in this case is the terrain. This is simply the exact same thing as the previous object. We just need to change the world matrix, so no need to spend more time on it. The only thing we have left is to review the changes in the lighting program. In the vertex shader I've added the WVP matrix for the light source. There is also a new output attribute for the position of the vertex in light space. We use the regular WVP matrix to transform the position into GL position and the secondary WVP matrix to transform it into light space. The fragment shader has a new input attribute which corresponds to the light space position from the vertex shader. We also need to add a uniform sampler for the shadow map. In the new function calc shadow factor, we divide the light space position vector by its W component. As we already discussed, this is to replace the automatic perspective division since the same value goes through GL position in the shadow pass. But this is a standard attribute, so no perspective division. Now, in theory, the x, y, and z coordinates are in the minus 1 to 1 range after the division. I'm saying in theory, since there is no clipping for regular attributes when the triangle is inside the window in the lighting pass, so this could be a problem down the road, but let's ignore it for now. The X and Y now represent the normalized device coordinates of this fragment in the shadow pass. We can use them to sample the depth of the closest pixel in the shadow map. But before we do that, we have to transform the coordinates to texture space, which is 0 to 1. This requires multiplying by a half and adding a half. 
We actually have to do the same for the Z because when it reaches the depth buffer, it undergoes the same transformation during viewport mapping. We can now sample the depth of the closest pixel and compare it to the depth of the current pixel. If the sample depth is smaller, it means that there is another pixel which is closer to the light source. In this case, the return shadow factor is a half. So the shadow is not a total darkness, but a bit more moderate. In the L section, we return 1 for no shadow. This is also something that should be tuned. Notice that we add a small bias to the sample depth, effectively making it a bit further than it actually is. This is to avoid a phenomenon called shadow acne, when some of the pixels end up in the shadow incorrectly. This can happen when the light hits the surface at some angle, and the same depth value is sampled from the shadow map for two neighboring fragments. In this case, the Z of one fragment may be larger than the sample depth, while the Z of the other fragment is smaller. So one is shadowed while the other is not. We solve this using this small bias, and there are methods for better bias approximations which we will cover in the next tutorial. Now that we have the shadow factor, we need to integrate it somewhere in the lighting calculations. In my implementation, this factor is passed to calc light internal and multiplied by the diffuse, specular, and dream colors. Ambient lighting is unaffected by any shadow by definition. Notice that for a directional light, we simply pass 1 as the factor because this light type is still not supported. Okay, there are many things that we can do to improve the shadow quality, but since this video is already long enough, let's wrap up for today. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.